Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Alfano, the CEO of VegTech Invest. Thanks for being with me for another side of Upside and Impact, another edition of Upside and Impact Investing for Change, now distributed by the New York Stock Exchange podcast, plas- podcast platform, etfcentral.com, and then always on iTunes and Spotify, where you can subscribe and, of course, leave a review. I am in Dubai, which is I I don't have my typical background. It is late in the evening for me, just the tail end of COP28. As many of you know, I've been going live from Dubai every day for COP28. It's been a huge COP for food systems transformation, certainly from the financial perspective, as governments have also called on the private sector to come in and address what is 30% of the world's global greenhouse gas emissions, with animal agriculture being a whopping 60% of that, so uh, 18% of the global greenhouse gas emissions and 32% of the world's methane emissions coming from animal agriculture. So very interesting to see world leaders Think about our future and the future of food. So now as we enter into 2024, I thought it would only make sense to have my very last podcast of 2023 on Upside and Impact be with a futurist. Now, before you think, "Uh uh-oh, are we going to talk hands waving over crystal balls. I want to bring on my guest today and assure you that it's going to be much more strategic than this. Roger Spitz, futurist, author, and president of Texistential. I want to thank you for being with me today. Uh, It's wonderful to be here, Elizabeth, and uh, look forward to our exchanges. So, of course, we're going to get into the definition of Texistential, which I do hope that I am pronouncing correctly. But first, I want to read your bio because I really want to give everybody a little bit of a sense of what is a futurist and really sort of how you came to this. So let's go over your background uh, for a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, In addition to being the president of Texistential, you're also the chair of the renowned Disruptive Futures Institute. Yes, there is a Disruptive Futures Institute. And let's be frank. We need it as the world is about to implode. And I think many people feel that almost every day. So uh, that is headquartered in San Francisco. You are a formal global head of technology and M&As at BNP Paribas, and you have advised over 50 transactions with a combined deal value of $25 billion. You launched the bank's U.S. mergers and acquisitions practice in San Francisco, which is where I believe you currently live, or at least um, in the outskirts of San Francisco, Northern California. And you also built the the European technology and digital investment banking franchises in London and Paris. Most importantly, and maybe what we're going to talk about now and dive into, you have the four-volume definitive guide to thriving on disruption. This can be um, had at Amazon.com. And in anticipation of your fifth book, Disrupt with Impact, and given that it's just about 2024 and we're headed for a tumultuous election, I think we all know that, um, maybe we should discuss systems level change for a sustainable future. So systems level change, it's all we could talk about at COP. Um, So many systems breaking down beneath us. I wondered if you could walk us through your four drivers for systems change, starting with strategic foresight for adaptive and resilient futures. Let me pull up a visual, a visual, but maybe you can already start to walk us through what that means. Sure. No, thanks, Elizabeth. And uh, these are, these are important topics and I'm a um happy to sort of go through them so i think the starting point maybe for some of your your viewers might be what what on earth is a futurist um yes it, thank you but it but it connects directly with what systems level change and i think um maybe to disappoint some who are looking for the crystal ball futurists actually don't seek to to predict the future our 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 thinking is really that we accept that there's discontinuity that there are multiple possibilities that we need to think about um, the world with different time frames than just the normal short-term milestones. And that sometimes we, we should actually be asking ourselves questions around possibilities versus just looking for answers. So we don't abide by relying too heavily on, on assumptions and especially the assumption of a kind of controllable, predictable, stable and linear world. So really what we're trying to do is think more systemically think longer term, think about the next order implications. Um, what if, 
certain possibilities that are plausible might happen and how those interconnect. And on that basis, to come back to the, to the visual you kindly showed and to your question around what is systems level change, systems levels change is really acknowledging that we are not in a kind of reductionist, deterministic um, vantage point of the world where you're just looking at the past or looking at things in isolation, that ultimately what determines the outcomes is how different systems and different initiatives might interact and also over time and amongst themselves. So that's the starting point. Go ahead, please. Well, well, you know, Gus, I wish you had been at COP28 speaking to the leaders of the world because it's it's the integration of those systems and anticipating change. It almost seems overwhelming. I mean, I'm, I want an understanding is, are you talking about systems level change sort of at the government level, at the company level or at the individual level? Yeah, so listen, systems in reality are the way the world manifests itself. So it's only our minds and the way we choose to, to adopt strategies or, or policies where we kind of bring things in a more mechanic, mechanistical, deterministic and simplified way. But the reality is that humans are systems, our thinking are systems, and building, you know, our systems, cities, our systems. Um, so the question as to at what level it, it, it kind of manifests itself, systems are, are everywhere. And I guess the question is, if you are looking at initiatives such as climate, such as, you know, others that are societal, then you need to look at um, systems in the broader sense through society. And that therefore includes, and we can come to it in a minute, but what does it look like to drive transformational change for complex challenges across you know society and what have you and there you have to take the, the broadest level but if you look at it at the different units you're still looking at things system you should still be looking at things systemically even if you're looking at a specific innovation or technology or company or region and um, i guess the challenge for for things that are by nature global is really where do you draw the, the the line so if you take you know pandemic or technology or ai or what have you you're not you know it's it's ludicrous for certain regions to be doing things in a different way because ultimately you know you can't i mean we saw it with the pandemic take something that that's global of that nature and systemic any region that's shutting off and doing certain initiatives which are completely disconnected from the rest of the world it's not very effective. So, so the question then depends uh, as to, you know, thinking systemically and next order implications, you can do at any level, and, and that includes the individual, but certain of our complex challenges, no doubt the ones that, that concern a lot of everybody around climate, around technology, around education, that those you really need quite a broad um, perspective on them. So indeed, they take into account many stakeholders and many different aspects, of it, and we can unpack that. But that takes a lot of time. I mean, getting that many people to agree that you could have global systems change. I, I just look at the conversations over the last 50 years around food systems transformation, the system that I'm working in right now. Uh, I mean, many of the issues of the food system we knew 50 years ago and, and just couldn't agree on anything and therefore did nothing. And so now you have climate change to the extent that you have it because one third of the equation could have been addressed and wasn't, and that's food. And of course, energy people and electric vehicle people are saying the same thing. You know, the electric vehicle could have been launched in the 70s and, and you know, it, it tried and was kind of intentionally taken out, if you will. So it doesn't seem to be human nature for us to think about large scale systems change. We tend to think about ourselves, sadly enough. And, and I just, th these kinds of systems change seem to take a long time. Is it possible? I guess is that what I'm running? Like I understand theoretically, but executionally, it seems quite difficult. Yeah, I mean, listen, there's no doubt that um, it is more, by definition, these that's why these are kind of complex challenges. It's no doubt that they're more difficult. Um, and there are more ways to to have them become ineffective. So it can be either intentional, such as the reasons why today we have the crisis for the climate and others, 
it's absolutely intentional. It's not because people lack an understanding of what's required for it. It's just that there was significant, people call it lobbying, I call it kind of corruption, but significant lobbying um, to ensure that certain outcomes were achieved and not others, and they put in the incentives to make sure incentives determine outcomes. So the incentives for the world through lobbying ensure that you know the different industries oil gas automotive etc continued functioning in a specific way and that but that was intentional it wasn't a lack of understanding from governments or from educational systems or from companies it wasn't lack of understanding of what drives system change on the contrary they understood very well what drives system change and therefore they prevented the enablers to drive things in the right way. They had made sure they had the incentives that suited them. They made sure they had the regulation that suited them. They made sure they had all these things which suited the outcomes they were seeking. So I'm not sure it's necessarily a question of lacking an understanding of what system changes. I think it's a question of understanding what the incentives are and, and who's kind of controlling the the, the, the systems. And the second thing I would say, and this is an important point when it comes to climate, is that if you are in good faith and if you are trying to achieve the right incentives, then there are a lot of things that are harder in complex systems. And therefore, there's a risk of doing things that are ineffective. In other words, um, there are almost two aspects. There's the kind of real objectives of many constituents who are not necessarily aligned with what the world needs. And that's kind of intentional. It's not a lack of understanding of the systems. And that's why they do things in a certain way. But then there's a lot of the world who in good faith, organizations, individuals, countries who in good faith might be seeking to do the right thing, but who realize that in complex systems, it's more difficult. So take, you know, you mentioned, for instance, the electric vehicle, you know, any or, or food systems, any of these even if the a venture capitalist or an innovator or an entrepreneur or country is trying to do things in the right way, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily effective if you don't have the right infrastructure, if you don't have the right capital that understands the difference and the complexities mm -hmm. of scaling, you know, take mobility, how complex a city is. So there are a lot of things which, even with an understanding of how to drive change in complex systems, don't necessarily have an appreciation of what is effective versus ineffective. And so what we focus on are things which actually can help people understand better what is effective versus ineffective to drive these changes. And again, we can unpack these with specifics, but I hope that kind of gives some elements. Yes, everyone. So this is why there's a Disruptive Futures Institute. <laughs> Please Google that. You can see why it, it's important to have leadership on this topic to help people move through really large scale systems change. It, you, this brings me to my second question, which is your, if you, for those of you who are watching on video and not on audio, sorry, everybody on audio, but as we look at the graphic and we move to the right, you see there's virtuous inflection points. And I think what you mean here is that um, there are points in systems change when you can get more leverage than at other points, and that can drive critical mass adoption. I think that's what you mean here, but but I'll let you take it from there, and I'm wondering, is this really based on money? Is, is, is money that big driver here, or, or you're thinking of something else? Yeah, so let's unpack the Let's unpack this, and and by the time we finish, hopefully we'll we'll hit on the four quadrants. I'll let you Elizabeth yes. make sure we we do. But so on the virtuous inflection points, and you know you you're well placed to kind of you've probably heard it a million times a day over the past week or so. Um, there's obviously a very big focus on tipping points, and tipping points are tend to be used in a in a negative sense um, these days, and in the sense of something that's kind of major and potentially irreversible. So climate falls into that, potential advancements of technologies could fall into that. And the point about tipping points and or inflection points is that actually they don't have to be necessarily you know, positive or negative. And in fact, even disruption is not necessarily positive or, or negative most of the time. It's actually neutral. It much depends on how you prepare for it, how you think about it, and how you respond to it. And so to answer your question, virtuous inflection points are those elements which certain initiatives, they might be small, they might be, um, you know, different types, and some might be 
policy, some might be regulatory, some might be consumer behaviors that change, that all together combined in a way that is virtuous and that make a huge difference. So if you take, um, you know, food systems, or electric vehicles, let's just look at those two just, just to kind of give a few concrete examples. Electric vehicles, if you put legislation like California has that by a certain cut of date, I think it's 2035, you can't sell any more um, gasoline cars, it forces within sort of the decade the various innovations yeah. to, to develop. By doing that, you're learning to do things better, cheaper, hopefully with fewer external effects, because we know they also extend that negative externalities with, with batteries and that. But hopefully that learning curve can get people to start changing. If you're doing the right thing with infrastructure, which is effective, we've seen recently some of the big automotive OEMs shift to, to Tesla systems. So people are kind of building critical mass and the importance for the infrastructure. If you then have the OEMs, the consumers, if you can reach a price point where you're paying for an electric vehicle that's as the same price or cheaper than gasoline, Little by little, and that there's no, you know, you have the longer battery life. All of these things will move to at some point being a sort of virtuous inflection point around people no longer seeing the need or being able to, or allowed to, or finding a benefit from using cars other than electric vehicles. And the same thing can happen with food systems in terms of if you reach the kind of right kind of textures and quality and price points and, and externalities around alternative protein if the consumers are changing their minds, if there's sort of various tax or regulatory or other incentives, when all these come together, they can create virtuous inflection points. And the key thing here, coming back to systems, is there are also barriers to that happening. So for instance, some of the editing and negotiations, which are unfortunate for COP28, around, you know, um, well, you know, the carbon emissions and whether you're kind of stamping it out or stopping it and how you legislate it, whether it's kind of a, a good to have or, reg or, or an obligation. These kind of things are effectively driving whether there'll be a virtuous inflection point or not. This is probably yeah. that the technology is able to, to help the inflection points, the consumer behaviors as well, etc. But if there's no incentives for the organizations who are controlling that, if there's no disincentive in terms of what happens if they don't do A versus B, et cetera, et cetera. And they know kind of regulatory changes and it all feeds on itself to the tipping points versus the virtuous inflection points. So the, the final thing I just want to mention on virtuous tipping inflection points is that they don't, because you asked about, does it require a lot of capital? Is it individual? Is it institutional? It can be anything. Ideas can also benefit from virtuous inflection points, platforms and social media for all the the negative externalities and problematics around that. There are also some amazing things that you can reach a huge amount of people very quickly. And, and you know, if you get 20 or 25 percent of, of the population, there's a lot of research around, you know, social and, you know, innovation tipping points for ideas where you can kind of quite quickly move and create a movement. So it, it works both ways. And, and really what we're trying to say here is that, one of the four drivers to achieve systems level change is really achieving those virtuous inflection points. And yes, it does require more cohesive actions by more constituents than just the company deciding to do something. But that's the only way it can be effective. If, you know, if things are operating in isolation, we all we all lose. Yeah, there's so much to unpack there, and I do want to get to all four of these systems level um, uh, of these levers to to enact for systems level change. But um, I'll I'll just say that I can see this working at the company level because there you have sort of a homogenous culture where in theory, everybody wants the same thing. Now, granted, it's probably driven by the CEO and the board of directors, and they're going to force everybody else to want the same thing. But you can see that organization acting in concert. And I can see for a household of individuals, the same thing might be true. I think it's trickier at the country level where not everybody wants the same outcome. So you sort of need to want the same outcome, don't you? Yes, you, you yes. do. Um, having said that, you don't need every single person to 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 sign every aspect for there to be very effective change that's implemented to 
to enable and support virtuous infection points. So let's just take a concrete example around the topics that are dear to, to you and me around climate. So admittedly, things can change with different governments. Um, but in Europe, there's a reasonable amount of support and legislation in terms of, you know, um, incentives and regulatory and some accountability and disclosure, which move things in the right direction for certain energy efficient and other initiatives which are beneficial for, for climate. In the US, there's been, you know, the biggest ever um, release of funds which are supporting at many different levels. And that affects policy, it affects R&D, it affects um, regulations, it affects um, subsidies, it affects many things. Um, and, you know, be interested in your views on that. But ultimately, these sums are quite substantive. They affect the sort yes. of different levers for change at the organizational, societal levels. They allow the consumer, who should not be the one impacted negatively by having to spend more, you know, consumers are already going through a lot of challenges um, every day. They need to have things where there's a facilitation around innovation, around uh, subsidies, around um, scaling, which means that if they choose to buy certain alternatives, that they're not less well off by that choice. And so I personally believe that some of these you know, subsidies, policies, regulations, et cetera, are done at a level which is you know, helpful for the systems change, which is not at the company level, but which will drive the outcomes of the company level. Once the companies are taxed in certain ways on certain initiatives versus others, once the incentives are disclosed, once the impacts of the initiatives of the companies are disclosed through disclosure, and once you put all that together, you're tying in a lot of elements which support um, transformational change and which are not dependent just on an individual or specific organization. Yeah, I see that. So there's a there's an inflection point when you're sort of past the point of no return because you have so much energy or so many um, policy changes, et cetera, or, or, or money or ideas that catch on or, you know, price parity or, you know, at some point this combination is just working in concert such that you kind of can't go backwards. Um, so I, I want to move on to the the third point, and, and we can talk about subsidies once we get through all of these, because that's a great one. But I'll, once we get through these four, because I want people to understand, because I think we're going to have a very tumultuous 2024. We'll get to predictions as well. But you know, we do have that election, and the economy is still up and down, and so many systems changes all at once, climate change, vehicles, food, and they all are happening at once. So I think it's a lot for people to wrap their minds around. So so let's see how we can be best prepared for the future as we um, start on another year here. So, so driver number three is transformation rather than point solutions. And this just makes so much sense to me. So I think what you're talking about is you're only going to get systems level change and really solve large issues if you have complete transformation rather than systems tweaks. Is that correct? Yeah. So the way I, I try to introduce this topic, I'm not sure it's the most intuitive or easiest, but that that's kind of how I feel about it. Um, is that effectively a lot of the innovations or technologies might be point solutions. If you take an application, like Slack, if you take a software, if you take a product, if you take WhatsApp, these, I'm not saying they kind of on systemic implications, but effectively they kind of point solutions. They're trying to focus on some specific task and ultimately the determinant as to whether they're effective or successful or not is people wanting to buy that software or product or what have you. Now, if you take, I, I quite like to use um, NASA's technology readiness level, which basically was initially developed for space, but you can use it for any innovation or technology. Zero, so it goes from zero to nine. It scales different evolutions. Zero is like idea stage, fundamental research. It's esoteric. And then nine is fully launched, developed, commercialized, available, etc. So if you take a product like we talked about, you know, software, nine is basically where... It's available, you can buy it. And again, it's successful, the term will be determined by people wanting to buy it or not. Um, and along the way, at around five or six out of nine, maybe there's a there's a startup or company that needs funding and it's its ability to raise funding 
or not, which might determine its success. And then it's depending on whether people actually buy it or not. And that is often used in, um, in kind of Silicon Valley or other places. And I'm not saying Silicon Valley is, is great or perfect and far from it, very critical of it. But just to illustrate where a lot of innovation and venture capital happens, the value of death is often found at five or six where an idea or company doesn't reach the next stage to raise the funding. And the point, and those are for point solutions. Now, the challenge with some of the complex problems like climate and climate tech and that is that effectively you have an additional hurdle. First of all, the, the funding itself is more intricate because you need often a combination of policy, infrastructure, different time horizons, everything you, you know inside out, of course, from the companies you invest in and, and follow. Um, so the, the funding itself is difficult, but the most difficult is that when it starts reaching 708 for full deployment and commercialization, when you move from a controlled environment to scaling in a complex, dynamic, unpredictable world, like smart yes. cities, like food systems, basically, you're no longer just dependent on the point solution, having enough adopters that sort of say, yes, it's great and it sells well. It needs to interact effectively with a city, with the food systems, with other things. And so the, the biggest danger for climate tech is this commercialization valley of debt, where it got its funding, it's moved on, it's proven in controlled, small um, environments, and effectively it has trouble deploying, scale, scaling, interacting in complex dynamic systems. And these are all complex dynamic systems. And so that is the transformation versus point solution. And those are kind of some of the considerations for driving change with these complex challenges like climate. Well, so this makes me think then that systems level change is a little bit based on luck because you can't always know in a dynamic world when you're going to hit a pandemic or when the zeitgeist of the consumer I'm speaking for food now is going to change and something that was, you know, the hip thing, you know, maybe isn't anymore or, you know, and I guess, uh, again, speaking of food, I guess people could have seen that more and more people would eat on the go that fast food would move into not only fast food, but maybe just like snacks are your dinner. You know, the snack category is just expanded incredibly. And so this younger generation that's used to ordering food and doesn't really sit down at the dinner table with family anymore, or even with boyfriends, food is something you do on the go and you have ordered to you and you just it, it's not this formal dinner situation anymore. So I guess people could have foreseen that, your step number one, strategic foresight. But I do feel that a little bit of this is based on, you know, what's popular, what what things you can't always foresee. Is that, would you agree with that or no? So I don't think that things are dependent on luck, personally, um, in the sense of dependent on being, if you're lucky, things will work out. If you're unlucky, things will not work out. Because for me, this um, implies that we have no freedom, agency, and choice, and that things are predetermined. And this is why I personally not a huge fan of some of the language that's being used around polycrisis, metacrisis, permacrisis, because it, it kind of embeds this idea that it's a crisis. It's only negative. We can't get out of it. And it's pervasive and ambient mm. and every way. And so it brings me now as a natural segue, with segue, whether it's deliberate or not, Elizabeth, but I think it, in a way it please. is deliberate, which is around, sorry, you're going to say? No, no. Yes, please. I, I agree. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Uh, which brings us to the first question around what is what is a strategic foresight for resiliency? What is it to be kind of thinking in a resilient way so that we aren't just dependent on, on luck? So from my perspective, what we mean by being anticipatory, by, by being foresight and how that builds resiliency and how that reduces the pure luck is the following. First of all, we can't predict anything. So the idea of sitting there and looking at trends and having some sense of what it means it's the, by definition, there's no date on the future. The future is unpredictable. So the idea is really to put a framework where we are asking ourselves questions around what does it mean to be 
adaptable, to be resilient, mm -hmm. and to be able to leverage on possibilities and opportunities that might reveal themselves. And so this anticipatory thinking, it means you're taking into account the way the world is today, the way it could evolve, not just from trends or the expected, but a broader set of possibilities, some which are very positive because we can create virtuous inflection points, we have agency, freedom and choice, things are not predetermined, some which we can do at an individual level, some at an organizational level, some at societal level or play a part in, in driving them. And once we map out that set of plausibilities, there's some that are possibilities in the opportunistic sense of the world for value creation, for satisfaction, for fulfillment, and some that are more risk management in terms of building resiliency and systems. So take the pandemic. Sure, you can't predict the pandemic. Um, no one knows if and when exactly what will happen. However, the world was very clear that there was an extremely strong likelihood of some yes. major pandemic yes. falling within the next few years. There are a million organizations that it's kind of evident. And for those yes. who are interested, there's a million postmortems on, on the COVID pandemic. Governments, individuals, organizations, hospitals, all kinds of different constituents took intentional decisions to ignore those because they assumed there was a low probability and they decided to save a few billion dollars to waste tens of millions of lives and to waste a few trillion dollars. Now, that's a choice. And the mistake in that choice is what Nassim Taleb um, talks about in terms of anti-fragility, which is asymmetrical risk, which is someone sort of says, OK, let's probabilize and say there's only 1% chance of this happening, positive or negative, and ignore the fact that that is asymmetrical, that if that does happen, the impact is so existential or whatever and so that is where, if you're thinking of the world with multiple possibilities, some which are avoiding risk, where you build resiliency for those, and some which are opportunistic for value creation, and you think about some initiatives that you can take in relation to those plausible outcomes, that's where you're moving into a way of thinking in an anticipatory way. And so if you then connect that to what, constitute transformative versus point solution to what constitutes inflection points, you're starting to think about, okay, what resiliency should you have for certain events? What opportunistic initiatives should you be planting seeds for? And, and what are the ingredients for virtuous inflection points and transformative change, which are mo more likely to drive effective systemic change than, than otherwise? And so, yeah, so those are some elements. I mean, I could go on a lot, but maybe yeah. that, that helps. Yeah, you know, um, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see this kind of position held by an individual, let's say the futurist position, uh, the chief futurist officer at a company, but I do see it often in science where really they model all of the possibilities and then they determine the level of risk they're in for each and the likelihood of each and then make decisions accordingly. So now that we're talking about it, I do think some people or let's say organizations think this way. So strategic foresight would just be through modeling all of the uh, potential outcomes and then making decisions from that data. And then from there, moving on to the virtuous inflection points, trying to get enough critical mass that the thing goes and then, you know, working so that there's pure transformation and not getting stuck on, let's say, Dally, Valley of Death, which I still am having trouble with that one a little bit because, you know, because of the pandemic, which, yes, I do agree, was completely um, predictable given the knowledge that was um, available and it was ignored. But then there was the economic crash due to the pandemic. So economic tightening is because we had economic um, free for all, if you will. And that was because of the pandemic. So that's a little bit like completely out of your control. So I, I also am going off on a tangent, but I also do, do believe we have agency, but I'm struggling with that one a little bit. But I, I um, would you agree that there are like science does model outcomes and options and and so there is kind of some some industries already do a lot of strategic foresight thinking i guess that's what i'm saying uh, listen the the great points you're raising and i think the the fact that you're raising things like that and you're an extremely well-versed 
savvy, you're, you, you follow many companies that are listed, you speak to many of the decision makers is, is very interesting because the, um, what you're describing is indeed the way some of these topics are perceived and addressed by much of the world. Um, I personally don't think it's, it's the right way of thinking about them. And I'll, I'll mm, kind of great. give you two or three elements, but, but I, I agree with you that it's, um, um, it's the way most of the world thinks about risk management and thinks about opportunities. And so to be a bit more specific, the, the two or three areas where, you know, we have failed as, as foresight practitioners to, to make um, the world more kind of tuned into these ideas is the following. I think, first of all, in terms of science and risk management and probabilization and that, these are very important. I believe in science. Science creates miracles and all that. The only thing I would say is that um, when you're thinking about the plausible possibilities, that's where you need more than just the numbers because there's no date on the future. And because um, you need the imagination to think about things which might be disconnected from everything you currently know. And the other element about the probabilization and the big models and that is that it relies on stable and known parameters. That is why the Fed had no idea and still has no idea about what inflation would be, etc. Because these are fundamentally predictable. So to try and modelize uncertainty doesn't work for complex, dynamic, unpredictable systems, which is the world. And the fact that it's worked quite often for decades and from time to time you have a 2000 crash and then a 2008 financial crash, and then we go back to normal. I personally think that um, there's an inverse relationship between uncertainty and predictability. And the more uncertainty there is, the greater the cost of relying on assumptions. And some of the modelization and risk management, I'm not saying it's not important, but to derive decisions without thinking more broadly of both possibilities as a positive thing and things that can happen, it's it's so my point is that we need to add imagination and understanding the multiplicity of possibilities and the fundamental inherent unpredictability of the models and what's happening to not just rely. And when I say rely, I mean to the exclusion of everything else. So science and the risk management are right to do what they do. But if that is to the exclusion of exploring, building resiliency for other plausibilities, for building opportunities, for imagining things that are maybe unimaginable, the failure is not on the model, but on our lack of imagination for not thinking about things. And that is why the world is where it is today to a degree. You gave a good example, which is, you know, could we predict the crash and the tightening after the pandemic? Well, effectively, Maybe not, but organizations and governments did not build resiliency to subside shocks. So look at how many, you're well positioned, but what we're talking about is, is live on NYSE, you're, you're, you're dealing with listed companies every day. Think about between, over the past few years pre-pandemic, between 500 billion and $1 trillion were bought back as share buybacks to have a quick five minute fix of boosting a share price to please investors who are focused on very short-term specific metrics. Now, what happens when you do that, and biggest culprits are the airlines and that, is that effectively that cash that goes off the balance sheet. And then when there's a shock, well, yes, guess what? What's the difference between Apple and others who have hundreds of billions or tens of billions on their balance sheet versus a company that needs to go crying, an airline company that bought billions, if not tens of billions of dollars of share buy buyback, that wrote those checks to keep mm -hmm. it happy for 10 seconds, Yes. Mm -hmm. So effectively, these companies, these same airlines and supply chains, when there was a shock, they had optimized supply chains. They had, you know, organizations for which I don't value much, like strategic consultants like McKinsey, telling them about optimizing, hyper-optimizing supply chains. The problem with that is that it's not resilient because there's a single point of failure. So if something goes wrong, that's right. where you get the supply chain. So I agree with you. We couldn't have and should not be seeking to predict specifics. But do you build resiliency where if there's shocks, it allows you nonetheless to kind of sustain them and maybe even bounce on them and maybe develop even in a stronger way to use Nassim Taleb's term of anti-fragile. So 
That's an additional thing I would add. And my final comment, if I may. So the first one was risk management and that there's no date on the future. The need for imagination to build resiliency and to think about um, some actions which are less resilient than others to sustain unpredictable outcomes that we may not have in sight. And the third thing is really a question of what is education? How good are the quality of universities? How well trained are leaders? How good is the schooling system? And how adapted is it to understand complex systems? Maybe the issue isn't that systems are complex or that the world is complex. The world it is what it is. Maybe the issue is that we are taught knowledge-driven things that are not necessarily, that are making assumptions about the world and that these assumptions are assuming a kind of predetermined, linear, stable, controllable world. Mm -hmm. And we're building incentives around that. And that effectively leaders, decision makers, school children, policymakers, government officials, everybody has a poor education that's not adapted to the reality of the world. And it's not getting better for anybody who picks up the news. Right. Uh, you can yeah. see it. And, and actually, maybe the challenge is not complex systems. Maybe complex systems is the way the world functions. We are taught to make wrong assumptions. We are taught to live with those assumptions, to do those to the exclusion of anything else. And, and maybe that is the challenge. So I'm just, just throwing that out there. <laughs> I, I mean, this is the reason I wanted you to have be on this podcast. It's just mind-blowing to me what you've just said. And I think it's so, so accurate. We were talking about it at COP28, actually, how from a financial standpoint, we've always leaned heavily on back testing, but of course the past doesn't predict the future and that finance was going to have to start to be more forward-looking and anticipatory because we have no resiliency relying on a past that in this complex world isn't necessarily going to repeat itself or doesn't necessarily really help us basically in the future. So, um, and I love what you say in that it relies on our creativity to imagine, you know, where, I guess we can pinpoint where there's weakness, but then imagine in our weakness where, what could happen or what could go wrong and then to build in resiliency therein. Um, I will sort of go back and say, that's a budget line item. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I can see where depart every company should have a department. You know, you can't really do this by yourself. It's better to brainstorm with people. So I can see where it could have a resiliency department of three people, let's say. Um, but we're woefully already unprepared for even even that. Um, I do want your comments, but I want to make sure that we get to the fourth driver of change because it's only fair to everybody listening and watching. So just kind of we're recapping here and uh, maybe some of this is going to seem esoteric to people, but um, try to stay with us. We're talking about strategic foresight for resiliency. We talked about that. Virtuous inflection points when you really get critical mass moving towards transformation and not getting stuck in that valley of death. So many companies now in economic tightening are going bust, basically. They can't get through the valley of death at all. So very not resilient. And now we're going to the fourth systems change. Uh, and I'm wondering the levers for effective systemic change. This may be the most holistic point of everything that you're talking about here, but um, Let's discuss what you mean by effective systemic change. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great way to to tie in everything that we've talked about, and it's it's really I'm grateful for you to kind of be so thoughtful and to kind of um, provoke the different elements. Um, one thing I want to pick up on, which is linked to, yeah, let's have that on the screen. That's great. One thing I want to pick up on, which is your point around it being a budget line item to kind of think differently on that. I, I would debate that in the sense that if you think about how much training is currently made, is spent, sorry, how much is spent on training, how much is spent on education, how much is spent on lobbying, how much is spent on all these? What if we actually thought for five minutes about spending some of that on something that is actually effective, on effective training, on effective way of thinking. So it's not necessarily that you need to add additional things. You actually just need to take a step back and think, is education, is our leadership training, are these MBAs, are these whatevers actually effective mm 
for the reality of our complex world? Do they help anything? I'm not even talking about good or bad or stakeholder world versus shareholder primacy. I'm literally talking about understanding the real nature of our unpredictable, non-linear, complex world versus relying exclusively on the assumption of stable, linear, predictable worlds and, and have decision-making which is informed by the reality of our world and not the kind of simplified um, one. Now, the other comment I want to bounce on this, and you'll see there's a smooth transition to what's on the screen, so we will get there in, in, in a succinct way, I promise you, Elizabeth. Um, the other comment I want to make is your, your, you know, we're talking about you can't just look at the past, and we talked about it during COP for um, finances and banking, etc. You may know this, but Mark Kearney, of course, was was running the Bank of England for for many years and uh, writes a lot about the different types of risk for for climate and many other things, and is extremely active in in all of the topics we're talking about, both from a kind of systems change, societal way, but also unpredictability. He's written a very good book on these topics, and I think he's very thoughtful on these topics. And one of the things that the Bank of England recently realized with understanding that even though the Fed and all these governments have the best economists and models and statisticians in the world is that they didn't have a clue, right? Because they admitted yeah. that they had no idea what inflation would be, how controllable or not it would be and where it's going. So that's pretty much um, nul point in terms of the, 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 the outcomes of what they're meant to do. They have kind of one job to do, right? And that really shows it. And the Bank of England, even though Mark Kearney is very tuned into these topics and they show you how challenging they are, during his tenure, some of this also happened, and he realized, and he, you know, the Bank of England is, is now publicly mentioned this a few weeks ago, that the way they modelize and think about risk management and risk and resistance and all that for disclosure, for, for systemic risk, for bank failure, is basically wrong, that they can't continue to just take whatever metrics, and because that makes assumptions about all the other things. So... Let me connect this now and wrap with what are the levers for effective change and how do they work and what are we thinking with that? Let me take a step back. The first thing is, this is kind of based on Donna Nana Meadows, who writes a lot about how do you drive complex change in complex systems? She's been, I mean, it's in the past, for decades ago, she started work on this. It's a big field and it's, it's covered by many people including scientists, including people who study chaos theory. There's, there's all kinds of different constituents who, who look at this. Now, what it's trying to do is to sort of say, in this case, this is quite closely adapted from Donald Meadows' work, is to say, basically, when you want to drive change in complex systems, you have leverage points which are not equal. And those that are the most impactful and have the most effect in terms of impact are basically the strongest levers, which is education and mindsets. Unfortunately, they're also the most challenging to our earlier discussion. It's not easy. But effectively, mental models, shared values, the assumptions you make about the world, the trust you might have, these mental models are the biggest lever for change. They start in the playground, but they finish and continue to the boardrooms. So the question there, and that's my little challenge to you, friendly and, and, and well-intentioned challenge around, are these additional budgets? Every day, there's trillions of dollars being spent on education from newborn babies to, to people in longevity and, and in future careers and all kinds of things. And how much of it is spent on understanding the topics we're talking about? So that's the biggest lever for change. And if we shifted the way we taught and all that, it would be helpful. Unfortunately, I think there's a lot of reasons why they don't change, in particular the US. There are too many incentives. It's like healthcare. You do not want people to be well. Yeah. You do not want people to, to, you know, you want people to be sick but not die, to be on drugs, to be, you know, this is recurring revenue. You don't want the educational system to be effective. So it's 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 a mafia, it's terrible, but but it's not an accident. If you were to change education from playgrounds to boardrooms, introducing these topics, the world would be ticked differently. That leads you to the structures. The structures are around regulation, governance, incentives, accountability. If those structures, if you see the world differently and understand the topics we're talking about, and you wanted to drive change, you probably would think about what are the incentives you're building in terms of either yeah. individual, company, societal. What are the regulations? And then the patterns and trends mean...
once you see the impact of the structural changes you've put through with disclosures, so that's the debate around disclosure for climate, with feedback loops, you monitor those when they're transparent, you can kind of see what's working or not working because there can be unexpected consequences, yes. both positive and negative. So you can monitor them over time and then educate in a better way. And that's why some regions like Portugal or others are actually introducing climate change at an educational level so that they kind of understand more systemically some of these things. So I hope it wasn't too abstract for those who don't have the slide in front of them. I hope it was kind of not too kind of jargony or technical, but, but effectively it's quite simple. Yes. No, no. I, I, um, I, I think what's harder to wrap your mind around is how really to bring these to the table. So disclosures and things like this, okay, that, you know, is easier to implement and, and structures and, and having the foresight to want to, to address these things. Okay. That's all possible. Education, I think is a very hard one. I don't even know if we're capable anymore. I think of the U.S. being such a divided society. I'm not sure the education system, which would have to be for everybody, not just one political party or the other, but it would have to be for everybody's kids. I, I, I don't. I'm not sure it's possible. I, 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 are you hopeful or not hopeful? And and before you answer that, I want to say one more thing about my line item budget. I'm so happy that you're challenging me. I'm just so happy that you're here. And I wish it wasn't 11 p.m. in Dubai because this is a fascinating topic. And I'm I'm just um, want to be so effusive about it. So if I seem laid back, it's only because it's 11 p.m. Um, it, it's actually, and I I hate to be so. Um, perhaps not creative about it after you've just encouraged us all to be more imaginative, but it's actually more expensive not to be thinking about resiliency yeah. in a holistic way Thought than awesome. it is to have yeah. your line item of three people yeah. and a new department formed. So I take back what I yeah. said, um, not because I have fully incorporated all of your statements. I, I want to be more imaginative, but I also think it's from a budget standpoint, it's less expensive. No, you're right. Um, so, um, okay, but I, I, education, I don't know. Can we do it? Are you hopeful? So, no, I mean, you're, you're spot on on the, and first of all, no need to apologize for, for anything. You're, you're amazing. This is a great, great exchange and, and that, and I'm very grateful to be on having it with you and you enabling it. On the, on the topic, you're, you're absolutely right. The line item, I'm, you know, thank you for actually um, verbalizing it as you have, it's actually more expensive. You, you, you know, you save billions to waste trillions. The reality is that yeah. it costs more to think in a kind of uh, singular, short-term, um, isolated, specific way. That's that's not the reality of the world. Um, then, in terms of um, education, so the the good news and the bad news, I guess. The good news is that they are. It's quite easy to introduce these concepts at school. I'm actually on the board of an organization called Teach the Future. Uh, Dr. Mm. Peter Bishop is um, is the founder of this and one of the most well known um, professional futurists and academics. He taught the subject for the past kind of almost half a century, um, and he's very knowledgeable about about this. And he's developed Teach the Future, which we have chapters globally, which enable schools and teachers um, to basically introduce these topics, uh, the same ones we're talking about, it's not rocket science, um, to school children, and it's doing very well. So it's actually easy to do if anybody wants. Then the question of, you know, where's society at? I think the reality, and we can, this is for another conversation, is that for a combination of factors, not least kind of social media, AI, and also interference from outside state and non-state actors who are who find it helpful to have the Western world a little bit more in a mess. Um, basically, there is a question of the effectiveness of democracies. You know, is it the end of democracies? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not pushing for, for models like China or whatever. I'm just saying that in China, it's easier to think that uh, maybe the outcome should be that 30 or 50% of the kids you ask want to be astronauts or engineers as opposed to um youtubers so thinking long term systemically in a, in a way maybe there are challenges for democracy um in the way it is now i still believe there's this room to be positive but i also believe that there are tipping points in the negative sense i believe that there is a risk um uh, for society and western democracies to uh, 
to either because of the lack of incentives and intentionally, or just simply because they don't know otherwise, the lack of education or worldviews or, or what have you, that they don't exercise the agency um, of freedom and, and choice. Because the thing about agency is that it's it's like an option, right? From a financial perspective, yeah. it's an option. But if you don't exercise it, it's of, of limited value. And so agency is the same thing. And so there's a risk that people kind of aren't aware, aren't willing to, or are wrongly incentivized to, to make the changes that are needed for society. And that will lead to movies like Idiocracy becoming reality. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it's funny because you're really talking about a systems change of the overarching system, <laughs> you know, the political system that we live in. So it's it's system change on so many levels. The the overarching system, you know, education and politics, as well as you know, climate change and transportation and food and others, you know, building materials and and um, for some, I'll even say, you know, relationship structures, etc. I mean, I. Do you think we can do it? I mean, I don't. Our humans. I just don't know that our minds are. are, are maybe it's not our minds. It's more like our own resiliency. I mean, how much change can one take? And and we you haven't even talked about human fear. Like I, I don't think that people embrace change like this or sort of thrive on or think how can I be healthy and resilient in a disruptive in a continually disruptive society, life, future, et cetera. Most people want to want to feel and tell themselves, no, it's all stable. It's all going to be as I predicted. It's all going to be as I've planned. Life is going to go according to plan. And so I'm not even sure humans are built for this kind of change. What do you think? Well, I personally... Um, I, I see where you're coming from, and I, I agree that it's uh, that it's a lot of lot of challenges. But I, I think humans are quite resilient, um, and I think it boils down to a few things. If you think about it, I think let's let's look at Zen Buddhism and and Eastern philosophy, for instance. Um, where change is considered to be a constant, where you accept transience, where you have a different approach to to these topics. Um, And then if you take the Western world where you're educated around perfectionism, around predictability, around the Newtonian mechanical view of the world and and everything that entails, and where you can't fail, you can't make mistakes, you can't be emergent or discovery. Effectively, is the issue change or is the issue that through education, through our family units, through society, that we're not basically acknowledging that change is a constant, that um, yeah. the world is transient, um, yeah. etc. So I think there's a there's our you know there's a question around what is our relationship to the world, which then ties into to education. Um, but yes, I agree with you that if we don't have that mindset around change, around um, acceptance, around uh, humility, around learning, around trial and error, that you don't have pre-cooked playbooks that you can just follow, that you have to think on your feet. And if the systems don't allow that, if society doesn't accept that, if education doesn't lead you to thinking like that, you're absolutely right. Um, we're kind of doomed. But I don't take that as a as a necessity. I don't think the world is kind of predetermined um, or that humans are unable to. But you are right. We don't like change. We prefer linear than non-linear. We we are challenged thinking about things in an exponential ma- manner. So I completely agree with you with all of that. The question is, as the cost and the impact of thinking like that becomes more enhanced, what do we do to kind of make sure we do build the resiliency and that we adapt to the 21st complex century or not? And if we don't, it might be indeed the end of society or humanity, what have you. Well, so I bring up then a different visual, and maybe we can talk about this, um, what we can do to kind of prepare ourselves or to get in the mood, start training. It's a different way of thinking, right? It's just a different way of moving through the world. And that's going to take some retraining and some comfortability. So how can we, what kind of tools can we get under our belt? And then uh, before I let you answer that, I'll just sort of say, and I, I hate to be um, like overly competitive, but part of this reminds me of Darwinism. And I think like those who can adapt to change will 
be the most successful. And I mean that as in you'll have a happy life. Now you might also be successful with money and other things, but who will, you know, fare the best, let's say, are those who um, can adapt. Gosh, I, I'm really grateful that you, you bring this up because you can debate Darwin and I know the different perspectives on him, but I, I really fundamentally kind of agree with, with that. And one of the most important words we have, you know, and we have four volumes with hundreds of pages each. So there's a lot of work in our definitive guide to tribe non disruption. One of the most important words I use is relevance. And I use relevance in the sense that it's not innovation. It's not some, you know, magic dust. It's a question of being relevant. What does it require to stay relevant in today's world? And I love the analogy of a uh, Lewis Carroll who wrote Through the Looking Glass, the sister mm. book, Alice in Wonderland, who's you know, Alice speaking to the queen and the queen says, oh my gosh, you're lucky, dear Alice. You know, you're so lucky because where I come from, you need to run twice as fast to stay in the same place. And it's not a question of just running fast. You also need to, to be smart about what you do. So there is an element about what does it take to stay relevant and some form of Darwinism. And to then transition to the slide you kindly put on the board, um, we label this our AAA framework. We spend a lot of time unpacking it. And we've touched upon much of many of these concepts on, on what we talked about. But effectively, to, you know, and it's a good wrap, what we consider is necessary to be relevant and to be to build the resiliency for our complex, unpredictable world is the AAA framework. And it works as, as follows. Number one, we borrow anti-fragile from Nassim Taleb from his work on, on these topics, and in particular, the book Anti-Fragile. We talked about some of them. What are the things, what are the foundations you might have that allow you to sustain shocks? And in Nassim Taleb's case, anti-fragile, not only are you resilient enough to, to su sustain shocks, but you can actually benefit from them. Um, you need to understand asymmetrical risk, which we talked about. We need to understand certain actions, which mean that if certain outcomes happen, that your foundations are just less good. If you spend all the cash you have on share buybacks and then there's a shock, well, that's a problem. If there are opportunities that are emerging and you're not planting seeds to leverage on them, because it works both ways. It's not just risk management. It's positive. So anti-fragile is a way of thinking and slightly more heuristic, innovative, emergent, trial and error way, as opposed to the more kind of command and control, hierarchical, um, risk management based. The anticipatory is, is the overriding theme we talked about, you and I, over the past hour, right? It's it's what can you do without seeking to predict because the world is inherently unpredictable, but to kind of think in advance of the different possibilities, what are the plausible possibilities? You might prefer some of those. And if you prefer some of those, what could you be doing to increase the chances of orienting towards those preferred futures? What are the next order implications? What, what are the impacts of, of certain initiatives you might take or external things that might take? So it's not disconnected from anti-fragile. Anti-fragile is the foundations. Then you're anticipatory, you're thinking more longer term, you're seeing how different eventualities might interact and what are the next order implications. And the agility in the way we use it, and I know it's a word which is every, you know, it's used by many people in different ways, but we use agility simply in the kind of strategic, emergent and cognitive agility that allows you to reconcile the longer term visioning of the future with the emergence today in the here and now. Through agility, you acknowledge that actually only the present exists, you emerge, you don't have pre-cooked answers to the world because it's unpredictable, or you don't for everything. Some you do, and you follow science and experts when you do, but some you don't. And that is emergent. So you need that agility as opposed to emergencies. You need that agility to emerge in the here and now, reconciling your longer-term vision with action. Certain things might be working and effective. You reinforce them. You amplify them. Certain things might be disastrous or what have you. You have feedback loops to kind of dampen things that aren't working. And so it does require a different state of mind. And so the idea with the AAA framework is to have the right foundations that are anti-fragile, to think long-term about the future, but to be agile in terms of reconciling the time horizons. And the final comments I want to make are to enable the AAA, you need to have to exercise agency. And that comes back to a lot of the points we've been discussing. If you don't exercise agency, this framework is, is, is of no use. 
And the final comment is there's a second A, which we, we have in the same way as agency, which is alignment. You mm -hmm. need to find, even though not everybody will agree on everything, you need to find some way in the system to drive certain choices so there's alignment. It can come, you know, regulation is a good example where not every single person in an organization or in the government agrees on everything, but you're still able to have alignment, which pushes it legislations, which pushes changes, or an organization which has an innovation, which ultimately has some kind of anticipatory governance, which is aligned enough to enable its agency. And then if you have the AAA framework, we believe that that helps you, however complex, unpredictable, and nasty the world might look. So much to unpack there, and I really wish we did have another hour. I too want to make some 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 comments because I want to unpack what you've said at least a little bit here. You know, at first I thought some of these things are very hard. You're anticipating the future. You know, I mean, the ha sort of how can you do that? And I was very um, deductive, maybe in my reasoning. I was saying, well, I guess you can create models. You know, I was thinking, how can you do this? But actually, people do do it, and I think of chess players that anticipate future moves. I also think, and I'm not a sports yes. player, but I'm told like the person at bat can kind of anticipate that pitch that's coming. And so I think it's, a, a, you, one can train themselves to gain these skills. And that's very exciting to me because- um, Absolutely. As, as, a, as a, like, it's gonna seem not related, but it really is. I've taken improv comedy and I can't, express how much I wish that everyone in the world yes. would take improv comedy because it just develops other skill sets. First of all, you have to be very present yes. and you have to live in the moment and you're, you're nimble. So this uh, sense of agility, um, you're nimble to what's happening live and in the moment that you can't predict. And I just, it helps one be so much more resilient and confident in other things because you're not kind of afraid of what's coming for you. You just have accepted that you have no idea, but that you have the skill set to deal with this. And this um, last thing I'll say before I kind of wrap up where we are here, if there's anything you're taking away from this, it's that you have to buy Roger's coming up book, Disrupt with Impact and his um, four drivers for systems level change, both on Amazon, the four drivers now on Amazon. And um, I don't need, wait, is that the correct title? I want to make sure I've said that correct title. Uh, have I the, gotten that right? The four volume of the definitive guide to thriving on disruption that is currently on Amazon. The disrupt with impact book, his fifth book is coming out on Amazon in 2024. Um, but I will, before I go into our exit questions, I will say it reminds me of Bruce Lee, be water, water being the strongest to, um, um, adapt. And now we're back to Darwin. Okay. Lots of, lots of thoughts all at the last minute. We have four minutes max, because if you can believe it, I have another meeting that I'm going to have right now, even though it's 1115 at night in Dubai. So I want to, gosh, I really hope you'll come back because I could dive into this for a, a long time, but if it's possible, please one sentence answers. What are your predictions for 2024? Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, the, I think it's really just what we talked about, accepting that we can't predict the specifics and that things are interconnected. So even if you can look at a specific eventuality, A or B, ultimately it's the intersections that determine the outcome. So I think some of the themes we've been seeing will, will, will continue, but that doesn't mean that things will be identical. They'll continue in terms of constant change and systemic disruption. Okay. Um, more of the same and yet more complex and plus the election. Okay. Uh, what do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Yeah, that's, um, that's, a, that's a nice question. I think it boils down to understanding the increasing cost of relying on assumptions. It's, it's kind of really that fundamental concept that... Um, if you're relying on assumptions to the exclusion of anything else, that comes with a cost. And the cost of that is increasing as is an inverse relationship between predictability and uncertainty. So as uncertainty increases, there's more, less predictability and therefore the cost of relying on, on assumptions is increasing. And that I believe has implications because when you rely on assumptions, you're not exploring or doing a million other things because you're relying so heavily on that. <laughs> 
Yes, I find that in my own life that things haven't gone back to the way they were since COVID and I'm just having to rely less on the assumptions of how I used to run my life than, than what I do now. These are words of gold, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this podcast as much as I am. Okay, we are down to one sentence each. You're having a bad day. Things aren't going your way. What is the phrase you tell yourself to get yourself back in the groove? I love Nelson Mandela's Long Road to Freedom and Everything It Represents. I'm born in South Africa. Um, and I think it's the, the, the phrase, I hope I get it right. I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but my ability to triumph over it. And ah. that is what I try and tell myself. That is wonderful. That is great. And that is so classic Nelson Mandela. Okay. Uh, you are running around. It is a crazy day. You don't have time for lunch. What is your go-to snack? Acai. I spend a lot of time in Brazil. My wife's Brazilian and I, I love Brazil. It reminds me of Rio. So Acai um, and in San Francisco and everywhere in California, most of the world, there's some amazing. They're almost as good, if not better than in Brazil nowadays. Everyone, you now have a sense for what is a futurist and existential. one word definition. What is tech? Are you trying just to say existential and bringing in technology to an AI to help one realize or experience or anticipate the future? Yeah, so I it's it's technology plus existential. And I thought about this idea of tech existential before the hype around existential risk and AI, but I don't use it to predict the future. I use it in the sense that the 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 we're moving in an era which I call tech existentialism, which is one where humans no longer have exclusivity around decision making. And so tech essential and tech essentialism is actually existentialism in the 21st century. What does it mean for humans who no longer have exclusivity on decision making? And, and that is something else to, to we can unpack. But A completely other, other podcast. Wow. Uh, it's clear, at least for me, that um, all of you should get the four-volume definitive guide to thriving on disruption out on Amazon now, and you will be looking for Disrupt with Impact in 2024, Roger's fifth book. I wish we could go on forever. Everybody on Facebook, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn, thank you for being with me, Roger. Stay put. Everybody else, I will see you next time. Thanks to the New York Stock Exchange.